Hi, Simon. Hello. So, we are talking with Simon Scarrow. I have here the latest book, at least the book here in, um, in the Portuguese version, yeah? Okay. Yes, yes. Because you already have another one coming, no? I'm writing at the moment. Yes. Um, so I've been busy writing it in the hotel. Uh, yeah, because it's supposed to have been handed in uh, about a month ago, and I'm, so I'm a bit late. <laughs> so I'm having to spend, unfortunately, every spare moment busy finishing it off. It's very interesting because you write at least one book per year. Uh, or, mo or more. Two. At least two, yeah. and uh, uh, I'm very curious. I'm an author myself, but not published yet. Yeah. May eventually, I really like to know how do you manage. Um, well, it's it's it's. Have you ever read Stephen King's book on writing? You know it, yeah. And you know he talks about writing as an affliction. That's how it is. So if I couldn't be writing, then I'm I'm actually quite unhappy when I'm not writing. I'm happiest when I'm actually in the middle of a book. So, um, but when I'm between books, then I'm thinking about planning the next one, but I'm also kind of, you know, you get itchy, and you, unless you're actually doing it, then, um, so it's, it's really as a kind of therapy for the affliction, that's why I write. I totally understand, yeah, I feel the same, yeah, yeah. I have sometimes one, two, three things at the same time, and I get exhausted just from it. Do you think, uh, uh, although it's thrilling for you, do you feel exhausted from the process, or you just feel exhilarated? Um, that's an interesting question. I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought about that. Uh, it's well, it, it's it's like any when you finish a project, it feels good. Um, but there is that kind of moment between finishing the project, um, and then you have to do all the edits and the copy edits and the proofreading, and that's really, really boring and unpleasant. I hate that. So the, there is a the bit where you feel kind of euphoric is only about a month long before the editor comes back with all the work that you have to do. Um, when I'm thinking about a book, when I'm doing the research, that's also a really nice feeling because you, you kind of, the more you read about a subject, you think, well, the original idea I had for stories for this, but what if I do this? So it's that, that point at which um, your original plan starts being changed by the, the research that you're doing, and you begin to see all sorts of other possibilities. And that's really exciting as well. I don't understand. The research is also my favorite part. Yeah. yeah. Because you. Um, I was trying to research more about you, yeah, and um, uh, my, my, my literature was in history and archaeology, so I totally get it about uh, the history, military history, and uh, I have to confess, it was a subject in school, in the university, that was not very interesting to me, but reading your books, I don't I, I, it's both educational and fun, because you can see the real life of the legionaries in the Roman Empire. And uh, I have to say, my favorite character is Cato, <laughs> or Cato, how do you call it? Some people say, oh, macro, macro is my favorite. And I'm, you know, because I didn't realize this for a number of years until my son pointed it out. He said, well, of course, it's obvious who macro and Cato are. It's not, you know, and I said, well, who, what do you mean? He said, well, Cato is how you used to be when you were a young student. Macro is how you have turned out to be as an adult and grown up. I thought he's right, actually. You know, I've become much more grumpy and you know intolerant. Yeah, as I've got older. So um, yeah, it, it's uh, sorry. I forgot what was the original question. No, no, I, um, I was just pointing out that my favorite is Kato, and maybe I was wondering. Well, I actually already answered what I was uh, going to ask you. If you see myself more self, if you see yourself more like a Kato or a macro. You know, um, I, I do catch myself being Cato when I'm thinking about, in, you know, academic stuff. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking, oh, or if there's an argument about something, well, I tend to see both sides and I tend to work through all the evidence and think about how that relates to kind of theory and things like that. Whereas macro is kind of, ah, just screw it, you know, it just is, it is what it is, yeah. you know. And sometimes that's how I kind of respond when I, as I get older. And I think, you know, I, I don't mean because you're both very young, I know. But, um, and, I, and you'll probably hate, hate an older person saying this, but you, you really do get to a certain stage in life when suddenly you, know, you, you kind of think that everything's a lot more complicated yeah. than you ever thought it was. Um, and it just gets more and more complicated. And the, the temptation is like macro, is just to say, you know, oh, fuck it, you know, that's it, okay, game over. I don't, I don't want to get involved in any of that. So, you know, I, I, that's where the, both those characters kind of come from, really. And that's why I suppose it's kind of they work together because really they're two parts of the of the same personality, even though they're distinctly different kind of characters. But then that's true of all of us, isn't it? We are different people to different people. You know. 
Do you want to ask something? You're okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would it. like to ask you, uh, so you've covered a lot of the Roman Empire and the Napoleon in, um, and all. Uh, what other time period haven't you yet dived in that you feel um, really also speaks to your whole body of work? It isn't about any particular period in history. It's about history, exactly. you know. Um, I, 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 I don't I don't kind of have favorite periods because the whole thing is a kind of continuum yeah, yeah. you know and the, part of the reason why I'm interested in ancient Rome is because so much of what happens in ancient Rome seems to have contemporary resonance you know particularly with you know America and pre US presidents and emperors and you know all this sort of stuff and particularly the one we've got now who makes Caligula look quite sane I think <laughs> so um, yeah so the, the, it, it, there's no particular thing the problem of course when you're writing historical fiction is you have to write commercial historical fiction. And there are some periods which are very, very interesting, but nobody would ever buy a book about it. You know, for example, I'd like to write about um, these two groups of uh, socialists, early socialists in Britain, called the Levelers and the Diggers, who were around at the end of the English Civil War. And they were basically trying to get, you know, uh, they were saying that the their idea of a logical conclusion to the uh, English Revolution was a kind of communist society. And of course, all the aristocrats who had just beaten the king were saying, no way. <laughs> so they basically massacred them, you know. Yeah. And uh, you think, well, you know, that is, the, that is the kind of the workers' struggle every, you know, every century, it's the same thing. They're idealistic, they have the best kind of motivations, and then they get betrayed, you know. And that, and that doesn't look like it's improving anytime soon. Certainly not in Britain, you know. <laughs> that doesn't look like it's improving anytime soon. Certainly not in Britain, you know. <laughs> I find it very interesting that um, you make history very interesting. I, I wish I had known you back then, when I was in high school maybe, yeah. when my colleagues would say, history is boring, history is, you know? I would say, no, history is super cool. It's for the cool, you know? Well, that's where all the best stories are, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it really, that's where all the best stories are, in the historical reality. And you just kind of think that, and this is one of the things that drives me nuts about uh, educational policy. Um, is that it's run by politicians who either see it as one or two things. They either see it as an opportunity to push their political agenda, which is what British politicians do. <laughs> Not only the British. Yeah. <laughs> or they, or they, the second thing they try and do is say, oh no, it's all about training people for you know, jobs, so they need to do maths, science, you know, languages and things like this. And history is, oh, it's interesting, but it's, let's push it to the edge of the curriculum. And I'm thinking, no, history is the most important subject. You know, because it tells us where we've come from. There are lessons that history teaches us if we choose to listen to them. And most sane people do, but politicians don't. You know, it's not like there aren't historical precedents for a lot of the things that are happening now. And politicians just seem to be oblivious to all the lessons of history. It's very interesting because actually, if you see history through time, history tends to repeat itself, right? I no, I, at least the patterns, you know, like you can, at least, at least I, um, I was thinking about that a long time ago. I, was, I, tried, I tried to write an article about it actually, that you can find some patterns and find out more alike what is going to happen because pe people are humans, yeah, and we, as humans we always tend to repeat the same kind of mistakes. Yeah. What do you think about it? Do, do you agree with this? I do to an extent okay. um, because, you know, the very first day I was at university, our, our uh, professor came in and he picked up a, a whiteboard rubber and then just without warning just threw it across the room and it hit the wall and went bang and we all like this. There's always one of those, yeah. <laughs> and um, so he said, what happened? And we said, well, you know, you surprised us. You came in and you did this. We weren't expecting it. And, you know. So he went out of the room, came in and did exactly the same thing. He said, so what happened this time? And he said, well, you know, we were ready for it because he, he looked at us and he went, so history doesn't repeat itself, then, <laughs> does it? To <laughs> shit. Yeah, exactly. So I thought, well, okay, he's right. You know, but as you say, there are these patterns that kind of uh, repeat themselves. But it's a bit like, um, you know, genre. No film is identical to another film yeah. within a genre. But there are certain sorts of homologies and similarities and stuff which, um, you know, steer you towards a certain set of expectations. And maybe that's, that's, a, that's a better way of thinking about history as, as kind of text within a genre rather than, you know, things repeating themselves and so on. That's a very interesting point of view, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, my God. <laughs> Um, do you want to ask something now? Yeah, I'm uh, passing the. What was, if you remember, you know, when your 
oh, well, approaching your teen years or so when you really start to, <laughs> no, when you start to dig in into like actually reading and stuff like that. Do you remember what was the first book that was just hugely impactful like throughout your whole life after that? Is there well, like one or two or one author? No, 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 not really. I mean, I, I know the book that convinced me I wanted to write historical fiction. Um, well, there are two actually. The first was uh, a book by Rosemary Sutcliffe called *The Eagle of the Ninth*, um, and it's a it's a young adult novel, yeah. um, but it's beautifully written. And you know, I read it to my sons a few years ago when they were growing up. Well, not when they were growing up; they were quite small. But um, <laughs> you know, and it, and it was a real pleasure to read. And I'd forgotten because you don't when you're a kid, you just read a book. You don't actually you're not so st attuned to the, the quality of the writing as you are when you grow up. Yeah. It, yeah. So when you reread something that you know you kind of just whizzed over as a kid, and then you suddenly think, no, I understand. this is brilliant material, and, and so Eagle of the Night. It influenced me then, but it also influenced me when I was reading it to kids, so I thought, because that's before I'd written any of the, the Roman books, so it just kind of re-sparked that a bit. And the other one is a book called The Happy Return by C.S. Forrester, um, who, he did this series about a, a naval hero called Horatio Hornblower, and The Happy Return was actually the first book he, he wrote and got published. And then, because it became a big success, he went back and filled in Hormlow's earlier career and then the later career. But the, this was the first one he wrote. And it's just an amazing book because it, what he, about a third of it is one battle between two ships. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you ever want to see, a, you know, a model of how to write an action scene, you know, and make it last, you know, um, it, that, that's it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, you know, I, every so often I pick up the books and read through them all again, but I always start with that one, <laughs> and, and I'm reading through it and I just get totally, I mean, okay, you know, have to go back and start again. So it's a bit like, you know, when they bring out a new Tintin book, or, you know, not that they will now, because they're actually <laughs> gone, but, you know, when I discovered a new Tintin book, I'll go back and start the whole Tintin thing again. Same with Asterix, actually. So, um, yeah, it, it's that kind of... I don't know, there, there are certain sorts of, you know, it's a bit, I suppose it's a bit like in Cato and Macro for a lot of the readers, that, you know, when they know no one's coming out, quite often I get people say, well, I, I'll start from the beginning, read through, yeah. so I can enjoy the, the, the new one uh, to them all. Of course, it's going to be more and more of a challenge as the series gets longer, because, you know, this is number 17. I know, my God. <laughs> well, That's I, impressive, yeah? Well, I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to be, you know, I, I was thinking How six, <laughs> ten books, you know, something like that. My publisher thought it was going to be about five, yeah. you know. Um, but it's just one of these things that, because I, I didn't plan the series out. I don't even plan the novels out. You know, I know where it's going to be set, and then I know what the main problem will be for the book. But then I let the characters kind of, you know, tell the story. Um, so you know, there's no reason why it couldn't go on for, you know, ten more books even. Bring it on. <laughs> It's, I think it's beautiful because Cato started as a slave, well, a, lux a luxury slave, yeah, from the from the emperor and stuff, and he was living a better life than uh, a free man in the in the in the, in the legion, yes. But uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, just a little, no, not little, he was actually tall, yeah, um, a little kid can grow up because he was actually a very smart guy. People were just seeing from his uh, outside, and he's. He's literate. He's a, he's a very smart guy. So I think it's very interesting that he, he could could grow up. Uh, well, he already start already ahead yeah, as a, as an uh, opio, optio. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of us find ourselves in that situation where we're, you know, very very well qualified academically, um, but we're with people who who aren't, and you have to kind of think of a way of getting on with those people. Um, I had a, you know, again, I, I knew this from teaching, I had a, a, a young student at 15 years old who, when I turned up, first day at, at this teaching job, first, my first teaching job ever, and this kid presented me with this document, he said, would you mind reading Ruth through this work I've done over the summer for the coursework? And it really should be an essay of 1,500 words. It was 35,000 words, and he'd um, written this thing called um, Methods of Social Control in Totalitarian States. A comparative analysis of Brave New World and 1984. And I thought, you know, and I started reading this. And it was 15. Yeah. And, it, and it was brilliant, you know. I mean, well, yeah, it's, a good, it's as good as a dissertation. And I was reading through it because I, I thought, he can't have done this. 
So I was talking to him, and you know, and you know, and as, as it came, I thought, no, it, it's all him. And he didn't know about things like you know Marxist literary critique or you know postmodernism. And he'd kind of invented those from first principles because he didn't, you know, because he didn't know about it. He just sort of worked out there, this is a, there needs to be a new way of looking at this material. And I'll do it this way. Didn't know about any of this stuff, so he invented it himself. And what was interesting is watching him in a classroom of other kids of his same age, having to sort of like it was it was painful to watch you know this really really bright kid have to act dumb in order to get on with the you know the other students yeah so we you know i i, I get that um and i've been in this you know situation when i you know my son's in the same situation now he's joined the army he did he wanted to train as an officer and then he didn't like what was going on so he jo then joined up as a, an ordinary soldier in the parachute regiment uh, yeah he's he's a tough guy you know and he's very very bright and he struggles to sort of get on with, all, you know, because the parrots aren't really that bright. <laughs> so he's Kato all over again, yeah. <laughs> like Kato, actually, yeah. I mean, he's he's tall. He's you know he's tough, but he's quite skinny. Yeah. You know. So. Kato then. <laughs> you ask something? Oh yeah, uh, I wanted to ask, how did you come up with writing um, about Napoleon? Um, you know, it, it's this thing we were talking about earlier about history being where all the best stories, yeah, and the and the continuum, and I, and again that was something I picked up at university because I went to a, a talk. Uh, some French academic came to the to the university to give a talk about the French Revolution, and at the end of it, in the questions and answers, one of the students asked this question and said, um, "What do you think were the main effects of the French Revolution if you had to kind of borrow it down?" And he said, "Well," and he thought a minute and he said, "You know, I think it's too early to say." <laughs> and I thought. He's right, you know. We're still living through the afterwash of a lot of this stuff. So I thought, well, there's something very, very, you know, the French Revolution is probably the, mo the single most important historical event of the last thousand years, you know, without a doubt. Because up to then, we have all these absolutist mon uh, mon you know, monarchies and so on, and suddenly the whole system gets completely carved up and, and you know, and it prepares the way for the modern age. Um, so I thought, well, that's really interesting. How do we get from this kind of you know, monarchical system to this revolutionary system where everything's up for grabs? And, you know, and how do you kind of write a story about that? I can do something about Napoleon. But I thought, hang on a second. He was born the same year as Wellington. You know, and his, his um, empire kind of crumbles and everything falls apart when he meets Wellington you know, in 1815. So I thought, well, here's two interesting characters. You know, who, one guy who is totally made by the French Revolution you know, he should have been just an obscure artillery officer. The revolution comes, he becomes emperor. You know, this other guy is fighting to retain a system. And again, you know, he really should have been in some sort of obscure post. And he's fighting the system all the way through against other aristocrats, politicians, and so on, in order to get where he is. And has to adopt a completely different way of dealing with politicians and his subordinates than Napoleon did. So the re revolution actually created those two guys, a, a sort of reactionary in Wellington and a revolutionary, who turns out to be a reactionary, in Napoleon. So yeah, I just thought, you know, that's a story that begs to be told, really. So, you know. But there are, you know, there are plenty of other ones as well. I mean, you know, I'd love to write a book about Zenobia, you know, because she nearly defeated the Roman Empire. You know, and you think, wow, there's a character. Because the Romans are, you know, one of the things you have to remember about the Romans is they, they, they are the, one of the most deeply misogynistic societies, you know, in, in, that have ever existed. And that's what, what really scared them about Cleopatra, was it, it was this notion of a woman being out of control. Yeah. We don't want that, no. <laughs> and, 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 and things, you see this, this trope repeated again and again, you know, through, you know, in Shakespeare. What, Macbeth, for example. The real scary thing about Lady Macbeth isn't that she's nutty or anything. It's that she's a woman that's outstepping, you know, her role in society and taking control. And therefore she has to be this kind of mad psychotic witch that needs to be put back into the, you know, into the box. That reminds me of a character that I'm... It's not my favorite. My favorite is Kate, already said. But I really like Flavia, you know, the wife of Vespa, uh, Vespasian. Is, I say it, yeah, because I, I read the book in, in Portuguese, so I say Vespasiano is the word that I have. I really like... She's the ultimate femme fatale, but she she's... I cannot describe. I cannot describe her better. She's a femme fatale, and uh, I already know that she had a tra tragic end. I don't want to say spoilers, because you have to read the books. It's really interesting. But... Um, do you do you write uh, female characters based on someone that you know, or because you, as as a man, maybe it's not as easy to write a female character? What do you think? 
I, I don't know. It's, it's one of these things. I'm very, very aware of this debate about cultural appropriation. Oh, nothing like that. I'm just saying that's no, maybe... No, 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 I understand yeah. that, and I, and I have a degree of sympathy with it. But then I think to myself, well, you know, the whole point of being a writer is to imagine yourself in somebody else's shoes. And that, and it, that, and that could be a gay person, it could be a woman, it could be a person of colour, yeah. you know. And you shouldn't be prohibited from writing about, you know, because it's, it's called fiction for a reason. <laughs> So, um, you know, it, female characters are interesting to write about. I did one uh, in a book I wrote about the uh, Second World War called Hearts of Stone. Um, and that's uh, about a female teacher, you know, who discovers the past about another female member of her family. And, you know, that was interesting to write about. And also, I, I wrote a, um, a crime book, a technological thriller with one of my ex-students uh, called um, Playing With Death, which I think has come out in... Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the, the, the hero of that is a female FBI de detective. It was interesting talking to my wife about it because she was saying, well, you know, the key thing that you, you've got to understand when you're writing from a female perspective is that the overriding preoccupation of women is guilt because they're guilty about, you know, whether they're going to be a good wife, a good mother, a good worker, and they have to balance all these levels of guilt in a way that men never have to. And I hadn't really, you know, I, I mean, I was aware of it, but, you know, the idea that you're having to live with this 24-7 you know, sh you know, and, I, and it took me a while to kind of get my mind around that. But according to the reviews, that you know, it worked out okay. So I think, you know, a guy can do it um, in the same way that obviously females can write about from you know male sensitivity. As, uh, as Flavia, I, I go back to Flavia because I really like the way you wrote the character. I, I I'm a mother myself. I just uh, one little kid so far. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I I really understand the, where where she came from. She wanted to for for her husband to go up go up f uh, faster on the rankings. She wanted the best for her son, and um, and her son was a little hard to manage and everything. Yeah, my, that's my oldest boy, yeah. yeah because I, I have a one and a half year old, and I can relate totally with Flavia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Completely. And stealing, stealing things and putting ones where, where you can ever, can ever find it, yeah. Well, that, that, that actually happened when I was writing that uh, book and scene. You know, Joe was busy biting my ankle, <laughs> and so that's how, that's why the boy ended up as this biter. You know. yeah. Real life to fiction, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I have to ask you something uh, as well. This is something that we're doing uh, with all the people, people know, authors, and that we are uh, interviewing. Um, since we're in Comic Con, this is all about the geek universe. What is the, the series right now? Or it doesn't, it doesn't have to be right now, but something, some series or a movie. You already said the book, because she already asked you. A series and a movie that you can resonate or that is your absolute favorite uh, right now? Well, I, you know, on the geek universe, yeah. yeah the, no, no, no. You know, this is the trouble. I think oh one of the um, problems I think of writing fiction is that it's difficult to read other fiction because you know how it all works. So if you're reading a crime novel, you know, ten pages and you get, yeah, it's him. Yeah, I know, I know, it's him because you know how authors work by seeding all the clues and stuff. And I, the other thing that annoys me is, you know, it's Marvel movies just drive me nuts. Why? Because it's. You know, there are far better properties out there. Dark Horse Comics, for example, have, have much better characters. You know, and DC Comics even, but Dark Horse is, is really, really good. And then in Britain, we've got some, um, 2000 AD, um, which is owned by a company called Rebellion. And they, are, they have things like Judge Dredd. They have Rogue... I love Judge Dredd. Ha Halo Jones. All these really, really brilliant kind of characters. And, you know, they've got far more interesting things to say than any you know, guy running around with his underpants outside his tights, you know, pretending to be a superhero. Poor kids. <laughs> I really like The Watchmen, you know, because I thought that did a beautiful job of deconstructing that whole thing. Um, but, you know, all the stuff with you know, the Avengers, the Avengers of this, the Avengers of that, you know, frankly, it's really boring. Formula, <laughs> right? Yes. Well, it's more commercial. It's what people want to see now, I think, yeah. Yeah, but it's just, a, you know, you kind of think, it's like Transformers. My sons were big Transformers fans. Yes. So I, I nearly shot myself, you know, watching Transformers 3 because it was so boring. You know, because... They destroyed the... the they destroyed it. Yeah. So, you know, there are, when there's just endless kind of re... You know, this is the problem, I think, of a lot of cultural production at the moment. We're just going through this process of iteration. So it's, you know, it's... Transformers 5 to 15 or something like this. Star Wars Part 9 of, you know... And you're just kind of thinking, where is all the originality? Where is all the kind of groundbreaking stuff? 
and you know it, it it just isn't there anymore you know and it's not there in art i would argue you know it's not there in film you know it's increasingly not happening in I, the last time i read a book that surprised me was a very long time ago you know i feel the same yeah, yeah. so i think you know we need to i mean i'm not saying you know it's like macro and Cato. i mean it, it, it's not breaking any new ground it's a historic series you know what i what i what the only thing i think that's you know saves it from absurdity if you like is the fact that we're we're looking at we're growing up with directors and they feel very very human and relatable to but, but also there's always a kind of like a contemporary resonance to a lot of the stuff that they're going through so you know in that i think it's that book there's some sort of you know nero's just been made emperor and he sort of does this thing about you know we're going to make rome great again you know yes <laughs> yeah and the point is, it, uh, it's, it's a bit of a glib thing to do. But at the same time, what I want readers to do is to think, crikey, you know, same old, same old. You know, dictators then, dictators now. You know, questionable people in power then, now. Absolutely, you know. So I want that kind of, the reader to, you know, enjoy the escapism and go back to ancient Rome. But at the same time, be aware, as you said, of these kind of echoes in history, these patterns, these repetitions and so on. Do you see your books going into movie well, they, media? The pilot um, yes. episode. Um, yeah, the, it's Village Roadshow, uh, the studio that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So they're developing it. Yeah, well, you know. Congratulations. Touch wood. I mean, I believe it when I see it on the screen because, you know, the film industry is notorious for taking time and then on you're on the verge of something happening and then the whole thing's cancelled. Yeah. So I believe it when I see it. Um, and not before, really. And it's going to be the, the, the Eagle series, yes? Okay. Basically, it's going to be a TV series um, with sort of four hours devoted to each each book. Oh, wow, that's a lot, yeah. So what they're, they're looking to do is basically cover sort of two to three books in a series, you know, and then that's how... So you can have TV series forever, yeah? Because you will just keep writing. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm get out there slightly faster than George Martin, but you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, that was very, very interesting. Yeah, you are way faster than him. Yes. What is it with that guy? I mean, you know. He's mad. Whenever people complain that he's not finishing the book, he does get yeah. mad. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my time now yeah, that the show yeah. finished. I, I, I think with George, with George Martin, he just uh, all the characters almost have all the same names, and I think he just gets confused or something. I don't know. <laughs> I just think he's lazy. You know. Hey, Martin, you are lazy. <laughs> Simon Scarrow <will> say so. <laughs> well, you know, when you look at the... You know, I'm, I'm not a particularly energetic writer or anything. I mean, you know, there are people like um, Asimov. You know, he was kind of like churning out books left, right and centre. And also the, the, some of the romance writers. I mean, you know, I, I, there was a British writer. I can't remember her name. But she'd written something like 250 novels. Yes, what's her name? We, 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 we have to edit this <laughs> to remember the name. <laughs> Yeah, but romance is... I think she's related to Diana, I think. Um, I can't remember her name now. She's pink all the time. But, um, <laughs> but she, she'd written sort of 215 novels yeah. by the time she's finished. I'm not going to get anywhere near that. You know, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up to about 35 at the moment. But, you know, I don't see myself getting to 100. You want to add something? I, let me think. Oh, oh yeah. Getting loud in here. <laughs> So what's the, how different it is or how different does it feel to write adult, more adult related content or the young adult, which is such a like important genre for formative years? Or young adult books, yeah. Um, there should be six, but the, because Puffin was taken over by HarperCollins and they, and they stopped commissioning new books. So the series kind of just went into warfin mode because um, it was supposed to be six. I plotted it all out and it was going to end in Britain and he was going to be when he got, escaped to Britain to get away from the Roman Empire, he was then going to be the grandfather of Caratacus, who appears in the first book of... So the whole thing was going to link up. You know, That was my plan. But the, the key thing there was, you know, I did worry about that, because I thought, how do you... Resonate? Yeah, well how, well, how do you, well, how do you tell a story to a younger person, you know? And at the time, I was, every morning, I was walking my kids to school uh, across this field, and we'd do this thing where I'd tell a story and we'd get to the school gates and I'd say, and we'll continue tomorrow. <laughs> and it was, it was all silly stuff. And um, then I started telling the story about this boy, Gladiator, and, and they knew that I was thinking about writing a young adult series. And it was Joe again. He said, well, why don't you write the young adult series about this guy that you've been telling us the story about? And I thought, yeah, okay. 
And so then when I was writing it, I would imagine myself sort of sitting there with a boy sitting in front of me and choosing the words I would choose, you know, to, to tell them the story. And it, and it just made perfect sense then. And I'd like to do more of that, actually, because, I don't know, there's something about young adult fiction I really, really like. It, it's, some of it, it's sort of batshit crazy, but that's a lot of fun in its own way. Um, but it's just something about, you know, when you're young, you know, everything is kind of hyper real to you. You know, it's like, I was, I was thinking about this the other day, because I remember walking along a wooden dock when I was a boy, thinking, wow, you know, this wooden dock is just really amazing. It's like a fort, you know, and things like this. <laughs> And um, you know, and that's how it is. It's a bit like you know when you when you're a kid and you're walking through a forest. If you look at and, my, and Neil Gaiman made this point actually, he said that when you're walking through a forest, an adult follows the path all the way through the forest. A child is kind of going like that. So there is something about you know young adult fiction I think which does the same sort of thing. We tend to you know adult fiction tends to be very generically straight guarded like that. A young adult fiction comes. Well, let's just have dragons. Let's bring dragons in. Why not? Yeah. yeah exactly. Or magic. Or you know, yeah, yeah. and this sort of thing. And that and that makes it, in some ways, I think a you know a far more fully realised world that you create. Um, and and it's not that things aren't played out that traumatise children. In, in you know, because <laughs> we are kids. You know, the, the single biggest fear of a child is losing your parents. You know, I, I was lost in Disney World for, when I was a kid for four hours because I wandered away from my parents when I was about four years old. What, some of the worst four hours of my life, you know. I think actually it's probably worse for my parents, you know, because we know that feeling as well. Yes. Um, but, you know, that, that thing about... And I was so worried about when I was a child in Hong Kong, losing my... Because my father used to drive really, really badly. And we were living on mountain roads and stuff. And I thought... they Because you know, they used to go out for dinner parties quite regularly. I thought, they're not coming back one day. So I used to spend all my pocket money on buying tins of food to hide under my bed so I could feed my brothers if anything happened to my parents. It's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's, that's kind of how children think. I had a phase uh, to, a little bit before high school, that I would have a pocket knife on my, on my backpack and uh, a matches and uh, a compass just in case I get lost. I, I had uh, something like that, just in case, yeah. You know, now at home in, in Britain, because of Brexit... <laughs> I've got a room, you know, where I'm storing food, I have guns, you know. And just... Back to Stone Age. <laughs> you know, I, I, I seriously think, if we don't get, get Brexit, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but if it does happen and it goes badly, you know, you're going to see real, real trouble and violence and all sorts of horrible things happening on the streets of Britain. If ever anybody in Portugal you know, tries to talk you out of being a member of the EU, you tell them where to go, you know, because they're dangerous, those people. Yeah. Nationalism is a really, really ugly thing. A deep, um, I don't know, difference between like the lower classes in Britain and the higher classes that's just been accentuating a bit, right? So it's just complicated. Well, it's, you know, the problem with, you know, when you, you know, we've, we've seen, again, it's this historic pattern thing again. You know, it's very, very easy to market extremist politics to ignorant people. Okay, and I don't mean that in a kind of insulting way. I don't understand. The yeah. ignorant, you know, they don't know the facts. It's not. So they're going to listen. Yeah. Stupid, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, and if you tell them, you know, if you say, if you play the the nationalist card, you know, our country is better than any other card. You can play the immigrant card and say those people are different to us, therefore they're inferior and they're evil. You know, and then you sort of play this one saying, you know, oh, what was the other one? They said, oh yes, and you'll be better off. So, you know, and that's all the Brexit campaign did was tell those three lies again and again and again. And, you know, and, and, and what's, what chance has truth got, you know, against lies that are easy to recycle? You know? Yeah, it was uh, surprising because there was like, it seemed like no investigation was going on at the same time. They said all these things about the health system and the money that was going to be put in, and then they said right away, oh no, that's not true. That was just campaigning. But we've also got now, the government have, um, have conducted this report about what will happen on day one of a no-deal Brexit, okay? And it's really, really bad stuff. And so now they've been forced to release this in the British press. And all the people are saying, well, fake news. Yeah, it's, it's just not true. Every, everything now is fake news. <laughs> we, that's, the, that's the age we've come to now. This is why I think history is more important than ever, It's because we have a generation of politicians who've realized all you have to do is just deny reality. And people are happy to do that now. And you just kind of think, 
Well, I had this argument with a Brexiter uh, a few months ago, and you know, he made these claims about, oh yes, the you know the EU is a dictatorship, and I said, well, haven't we just had a free and fair democratic election? And he said, how does that square with being a dictatorship? So I went through and you know took his argument apart piece by piece, and his conclusion was at the end, he looked at me and he said, well, of course, you can prove anything with facts, can't you? And I said, well, where do we go from here? If you if I give you facts, you recognise they're facts, and you still deny the validity of them. Do you want to add something else? We are running out of time now. Uh, no, 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 no. We're we're loving the conversation. Uh, yes, yes, no. But we have uh, we we have to wrap up. I think. We have to. We have, okay. Last question because this is we have to, we have to do today. Do you see my colleague's T-shirt? See, it says Cafe Mais Geek. What do you think is that? Just what is the first thing comes to your mind? Well, that, that's a pretty good picture of me on the right, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no geeks. Geeks should inherit the earth. Geeks know where, you know what best for people is, really. So yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. I hope you enjoy your time in Portugal. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Regalera. Yeah, is a little old. Um, oh, how do like you say? Sort of like a palace. Palace. Garden, palace oh, that's even secret uh, gardens. Yeah. Pan's Labyrinth, but... Oh, okay. Maybe you can uh, have a new idea from there, yeah? Wasn't it Pan's... I have no idea, yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Simon. It was very nice to meet you. You too, thank you very much.